welcome everybody to our session on plan review and then talking about the certification program at the Puget Sound Regional Council. Uh, I'm Paul Ingram, the Director of Growth Management, and um, we're up to 83. I think we had we had over 100 people registered, now 84. Um, so I think we can start going and we'll do some of the introductory parts and then um, and that'll give people a little bit more time to uh, join in as well. Um, but I hope everybody had a chance to survive, or hope everybody did survive the hot weekend, the record heat. Obviously, if you're tuning in today, you did survive. But um, also, it's cooled down a lot. So you have no excuse for falling asleep during the middle of our webinar. Um, let's go on to the next slide here. Um, so the purpose for today, um, PSRC reviews local plans and provides support to local jurisdictions. So we wanted to do this webinar um, to talk about the resources um, that are available to help you create your local plan um, and that work collectively to help advance our regional goals around better mobility, climate change, housing affordability, racial equity, and many other topics. So today we'll talk a little bit about Vision 2050. I know that many of you followed the process of seeing Vision 2050 updated and adopted last year. Um, we'll talk about the plan review program that we have, an updated plan review manual that we're very excited to share. A little bit about how uh, the certification process goes. I know some of you are probably familiar with certification, but some of you are probably new to it. And then also talk about other planning resources we have and do some Q&A. So we want to start off by just getting a little bit to know the audience. We're doing this in webinar format, so we can't see all of your faces on a big giant Zoom screen. Um, this will give us a chance just to talk a little bit about um, where you're at in thinking about planning. Obviously, in the Puget Sound region, uh, the GMA deadline is June of 2024, and we wanted to get a sense as to kind of who you are. So if you could respond to this first polling question of what type of jurisdiction or agency do you work for? And we'll give people a little bit of time to uh, see the polling. It probably doesn't take you too much time to think about how to answer this question. So we'll just give a chance for, for people to uh, go through the process of clicking. Showing right now, almost 80% of you are from cities. Looks like we have one participant from a transit agency. Yay, thank you. Um, we will touch on transit. Um, we have a few from other public agencies and a few from um, counties and a couple from consultants and and others. So thank you very much. Um, I think, Kristen, you shared those those poll results. So let's, um, let's go ahead and go on to the next question. Have you worked on a comprehensive plan periodic update? One of the GMA updates, the last one um, in the 2015-2016 time period. Again, not a hard question to answer, yes or no. You have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Um, and so we'll let people answer. We're close to the total. And it looks like we're kind of topping out. So one or two more seconds and let's look at the results. So over half of you um, have not. So that's great. Thank you for being here. Um, We'll talk about the overall process of kind of go through that GMA process. And um, you may be familiar with kind of the basics of GMA that says, hey, we have to um, update our comprehensive plan for our local jurisdiction, but maybe you don't know about the PSRC review process and certification. So we'll definitely emphasize that. And for those of you that have been through the process before, great. Um, hopefully we can tell you something new um, and share some new information, at least share with you some of the new things that are out for this cycle that maybe weren't around for the last time. All right, and do we have one more question? Yes, okay, we have a third question. Have you used the plan review manual and checklist before? If you haven't been through the plan update process, probably your answer is no. Um, 
but we'll see kind of how many people have used the plan review manual before. Um, some of us just got the checklist. Um, it's kind of a checklist where you can go through your plan, check to see if it's consistent with Vision 2050. And um, many people used it during the last time period, but if you were, but it may have been one person on your staff and maybe you weren't that person. We've also updated that, what we call the plan review manual and the tools. So let's look at the results here. And about a quarter of you have used it in the past. So that's great. We will share with you how it's been updated. And for those of you that haven't used it, we'll be talking about it and you'll learn more about it. So thank you very much for filling out those questions. That gives us a little bit of a sense of how people um, are approaching this planning process. Um, so let's talk about kind of where the, the GMA planning framework, I'm sure many of you are generally familiar with this, but we just like our little, sometimes I call this our onion diagram. I don't know if onions come in hexagons, probably not, right? But uh, it's still kind of the layers um, type of thing. Somebody can tell me a better analogy than an onion that fits with our hexagon shapes. But at the center, you have your local plan. Many of you working for cities, um, that's you kind of doing your community outreach, figuring out what's most important to your community. And at the outer layer, the Growth Management Act telling us, hey, you have to have a plan adopted that has all these elements, has to be adopted by June of 2024. In between there, we have both the multi-county planning policies and the county-wide planning policies. So vision is the multi-county planning policies. And then in each county, they're actually going through the process right now of adopting updates to those countywide planning policies. Um, this also affects, uh, well, first, uh, GMA requires PSRC to review and certify countywide planning policies and local comprehensive plans. Um, the state also requires us to review Sound Transit's long range system plans. We have um, our own adopted policy for reviewing and certifying center plans. So if you have a regional growth center, or a manufacturing industrial center. We review those plans. And then we have an MOU that talks about our review and coordination with other transit agencies on the review of long range transit plans. So there are multiple types of plans. Most of you are from cities um, and that's where a lot of our work focuses is on the review of city comprehensive plans. But we also wanted to note that there's a similar process for some of the transit um, plans and countywide planning policies. Why are we doing all this? <laughs> um, this is the big reason. There are lots of reasons um, we do planning, of course, um, many at your local level about your community needs. Uh, but at the regional level, the big reason is we will have about one and a half million more people coming to the region over the next 29 years, over a million new jobs. Um, and I like to think about that in terms of, you know, numbers of new cities or something like that. That's two Seattle's coming to the region and figuring out how do those two C Seattle's overlay our current communities in a way that makes our communities more vibrant, healthier and better rather than, um, you know, just focusing on the negatives and the potential impacts. But um, I see a lot of positive potential of how to grow in successful ways as opposed to just kind of dreading and fearing um, this growth. But that's the big reason is there's a lot of growth to anticipate over the next 29 years. Vision is sets out that, that idea, both those goals and objectives, some of those aspirations. It also has a lot of really concrete policies, um, much like your comprehensive plan. It's kind of the comprehensive plan of the region. And it was adopted was anticipated to be adopted last spring. And with COVID, it kind of screwed up our meeting schedule and we ended up delaying adoption until October 29th. And um, it is now in place. So we're excited to do that. And it kind of changed, turns the corner now. We spent about three years working on regional planning. And now with this period, turning and thinking about that county and local planning, some of the key policy themes in vision, um, very similar to the elements in your comprehensive plans, thinking about housing. When we did a survey of the, of the region, we heard people say 
Um, access to affordable housing um, was their most important concern for the region, but also opportunities for all equity issues, uh, the economy, greenhouse gas emissions, transportation, the quality of the Puget Sound. Um, during the middle of the update, we had the amazing and sad stories of the, the orca baby whales that were being um, carried along by the mother. So a lot of interest in how do we restore Puget Sound, um, open space, transit, and also just that way of how do we work together? Now there are, Vision 2040 talked about many of these things, but there are a number of things that were really new and different from Vision 2040. So if you look at the old plan to the new plan, see many of the same themes about uh, growing in our cities, in our centers, um, triple bottom line type planning approach. But the things that are new is, of course, we extend the growth to 2050. So looking another decade further into the horizon, um, we now have a really defined transit network that's partly built and that's very um, defined in its planning stages that we didn't have 10 years ago. Um, light rail was just beginning. Um, some of the votes had actually just passed um, at the time that Vision 2040 was adopted. So there's been huge changes on the transit front. And now the growth strategy is really aligned and targeted towards maximizing and leveraging that transit investment. We have a new chapter on climate change. Um, obviously this past weekend, just drilling at home how important it is for us at every level to address climate change. Um, there's new direction about taking on housing and equity at the regional level to be able to better support your local efforts. Um, it advocates for better and more sustainable funding sources, always a crux of being able to make a lot of this stuff happen. And then two areas that really weren't discussed much in Vision 2040 were native tribes and military installations. Both of them don't plan under GMA, but have a huge influence on the region, both culturally, economically, growth-wise, housing-wise, transportation-wise, and, and other. Um, and so there's better recognition of the need to work with our tribes and the military installations as we do our long-range planning. I, as I said before, the Vision 2050 is kind of like a comp plan for the region, very similar in its organization of goals, policies. We have what we call actions, which are these uh, directions as to like, how are we going to proceed with these policies? They're, they're kind of implementation steps. We also have a, a regional growth strategy that is a specific numerical plan. It doesn't identify targets. Um, that happens at the county level but it does identify growth allocations to counties and types of cities that help set the framework for setting the targets. And the timing of Vision 2050 was really important because it recognizes there's a whole bunch of planning work that's about to happen in the next few years. Um, Countywide planning policies are happening right now, local growth targets, are being worked on right now. Local comprehensive plan updates, we're hearing most communities are going to start them either at the beginning or the middle of next year. And then we're at the, at the regional level talking about our transportation plan and our economic strategy, um, as well as working on housing and equity initiatives that Vision 2050 lays the groundwork for those things. So we wanted, it was really important for us to get Vision 2050 adopted so that it could kind of set the table for a lot of this local planning work that will be happening over the next three years. We have a bunch of resources online. Some of them are a little bit out of date. So like with our plans, we're also trying to update a lot of our resources. Here are a few of the links. We encourage you to uh, use our website as a great search tool. You can search for plan review or growth centers um, or different housing and um, lots of different topics there. Here are key things. If you just do psrc.org slash vision, um, it will have links to a number of background papers and some of these uh, summary documents and crosswalk documents that you see here. And as we get later into the presentation, we'll talk more about resources that are available. So Vision 2050, you haven't seen it in print, um, partly because of COVID and working online, but we're 
just finishing up with a publication quality uh, final format of it. It has this bright magenta cover so that you can't miss it. Um, that will be posted online. We have a, a the final draft, but not final format posted online right now. We'll have this uh, final formatted version posted very soon, and we'll manage to print out a few copies, but mostly we expect people to see it online. But then that's directing the update of our uh, plan review manual and other resources like that. And that's where we'll talk a lot um, today and about how that can support your local planning work. Um, so just a, a little bit of kind of context as to where we are from last time. So it's, you know, it's been 10 years since the last major update to countywide planning policies for most, for the counties. Um, we adopted Vision 2040 in 2008. So, you know, it's been 13 years since then. The last round of comprehensive plan updates finished in 15, 16. Um, to some degree, we went through the certification process over the last few years after that. In fact, we have been kind of just finishing our last city of certification. So we think it's an eight to 10 year time kind of planning time period. And yet we're just finishing that last cycle. And now we're talking about this new cycle. It's kind of amazing. Um, Sound Transit's long range plan in 2016. And then there's always a continuous flow of regional center plans and uh, transit long range plans um, that are occurring and that need to be included in our different planning work. I wanted to go back a few years just before I hand it over to Andrea to talk about the plan review um, process that we have more in more depth. But so at the end of kind of the last process, um, like I said, there, there were a few cities where we continued certification until just recently. But in 2016, we went back and we did what we called taking stock, where we interviewed, surveyed, and had a workshop asking people kind of how did it go? What was helpful? What wasn't helpful? What could have been better? We got some really good feedback. And that, um, that taking stock project really kind of set the process for us to try to improve the plan review process going forward. One of the key things that we heard was try to, trying to avoid surprises. I think, you know, everybody hears that in their work in any context, but it was here where cities running into situations where they were either had already adopted their plan or they were close to adoption and they found out some sort of certification process um, at the last minute. We wanna avoid that. So we were talking to you today and we wanna talk with you early throughout your process so that we can help you during your scoping process so you can learn everything that you need uh, so that there are no surprises during um, plan review or certification and everybody gets certified very easily. Um, so you kind of see that um, that bar chart on the far right, that board process, a few people say it needs improvement. Um, and I think that's what it was, that some people being, when it got to the kind of the final end towards certification, some people being a little surprised about the process. And um, we want to avoid that this time. So hopefully we've made improvements to our stuff and hopefully we'll make improvements to the process over the next three years so that we're working hand in hand with many of you uh, during this process. I will note before I hand it off, you see that guidance and technical papers, the plan review manual, people had really high marks for, for that stuff during the past. So hopefully we've made good improvements. We haven't regressed, uh, but we hope to continue to provide guidance documents, pe technical papers, as well as the plan review manual itself going forward here that, that we hope are a lot of help. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea to uh, take you in depth into the plan review process. Thanks, Paul. Um, Paul did a great job of setting up the context. Now we get to get into the meat of the plan review manual and what we've been working on for the past year with many of you. Um, so like Paul mentioned, we took a lot from that feedback that we received during taking stock, but we also uh, talked to a lot of other stakeholders that have been through this process. Um, I love seeing that many of you haven't been through the process because that means that hopefully you'll learn a lot. Uh, I know we have a lot of seasoned plan review veterans that have helped us to make this better. So hopefully everyone will get a little something new out of this. 
Um, but whenever we were, get, you know, starting to do this update to the plan review manual, we wanted to make sure that we heard from local staff because you all are the ones that need to use this. And so we early in the process met with our regional staff committee to help shape the project scope, make sure that we were doing all that we needed to do in this project. And then we also assembled a working group of local staff from a variety of jurisdictions and counties. We wanted to make sure that we heard perspectives from both big cities like Seattle and Bellevue and smaller jurisdictions like Monroe and Snohomish and so our Snoqualmie and so we had uh, representatives from all these different jurisdictions, and then we also had representatives from the state of uh, state Department of Commerce, the state DOT, because we work closely with them whenever we're going through, especially the review of local comprehensive plans. So we want to make sure that we're working with all of the partners that are relevant. Um, we also made sure that this working group met with us five times to get through all of the content that's needed for this process, and we wanted them to really inform. And if and any of our working group members are on the call, we appreciate the time that you spent on this project. Um, lastly, for our long range transit plan aspects of the plan, we worked with the Transportation Operators Committee and our transportation folks at PSRC to make sure that we were, you know, really hitting the mark with every aspect of the plan review program. So in the end, what's in the manual? Uh, for each type of review, there are these four kind of basic things that you'll find. We wanted to make the manual really easy for a person to use. I like to think of it as if you know, you're looking for the resource for regional center plans, you can just grab the manual and go straight to that chapter, and then you'll find what information you need. You don't have to kind of hunt around and look for it in different places. So for each type of review, there's a section for the legal framework and the policy context. This is where you'll find out what state applicable state laws should be, uh, referenced and looked into, and then also how does Vision 2050 play into this? Um, there's a section on process, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then I think what most people associate with this is our consistency tools or the checklist. So that crosswalk between the multi-county planning policies and what the policies should be in your local plans. So we did a lot of work on making sure that we were updating those and we wanted to, to get a lot of feedback on how to do that. So I mentioned process and Paul, you said this great earlier. We really want everyone to be using the manual and our plan tools throughout your process. So we hope that you don't wait until you're done and adopted the plan and you look at our checklist. We want you to look at it as soon as you start thinking about your plan update. So using the, the checklist whenever you are scoping out the updates that you need to make, or if you're doing a whole new plan, hopefully it's a helpful document for you to scope out that new plan. And then once you get to the policymaking uh, point in your process, process, then really using the tool, filling it out and providing us early drafts to review so that we can, you know, like Paul said, flag any issues that are consistency issues um, or, you know, vision certification issues. And then also at the very end, once you've adopted your plan, update the tool that you've hopefully already filled out and then submit that to us with your adopted plan to kick off that certification process. Um, so the consistency tools look a little different from the checklist that were in the manual from 20, 2010, 2014. Um, like I said, we had uh, we heard a lot of feedback about what we could improve with these. We heard from RSC, the Regional Staff Committee, and our working group and others. So the tools, um, I think that they've been improved a lot. I hope that others find them useful. Uh, some of the things that I want to point out with the revamp is that, like I said earlier, we really want to emphasize these should be used throughout your planning process. So there's another reminder at the beginning of the tools. Um, we also heard that, you know, there are some resources that are just really good go-to resources that should be easy to find. You don't need to hunt around our website every time you're looking for them. So we included links to the regional plans and the, the summary of what changed between Vision 2040 and 2050, and then the policy matrix that really in, uh, in the weeds look at how the multi-county planning policies changed. And then, of course, a link to our webpage. And I think what a lot of people would find useful for this upcoming uh, review is the certification reports from the last time, because that's when we maybe indicated these are some areas that you could focus on on the next big update. So hopefully the, the link to that and looking at those old certification reports will be helpful. Um, whenever you get into the meat of the checklist, we really heard that it's important to show what's new or expanded in Vision 2050. So we have cute little pink new icons in the checklist that indicate things that are new or expanded. There are also open-ended questions that allow for planners um, and staff to tell us kind of what's new and innovative, and then also answer questions that you can't really easily answer by just putting a page or a policy reference, you know, telling us what kind of equitable engagement you had, how did you incorporate racial equity into your plan, things like that. So um, not as many short questions as before, uh, but hopefully you'll find that 
you know, answering those provide a lot of value and will be helpful for you, not just for this process, but maybe as you apply for awards or use this to prepare your staff reports into the future. And it's important to know the tools are available in two different forms. You can reference them in the manual itself and the format will look like you see here. But then when you're ready to actually get in and start filling out the forms, we created them um, in FormSite, an interactive form where you can go in and type in the information. And we'll do a short demo of that here in a bit. Um, so because we know, uh, Paul mentioned this a little bit, but it's really important, especially for those of you who were around for the last big updates, to know what's changed so that you can make sure to make uh, update your plan accordingly. And so some of the newer expanded focus areas from Vision 2050, um, I suggest that you look at the comprehensive list because that lists everything, but some of the things we wanted to kind of call out for note here, um, obviously racial equity has been elevated in Vision 2050 and the more emphasis on equitable engagement. So we'll be looking for that and that's uh, you'll see that more present in the up updated checklist. Also, the housing sections are much more expanded in looking at um, how local plans can expand access and affordability. Uh, Vision 2050, for the first time, calls out health disparities and calls for all of us to work together to address those. And so that's something new in the checklist that you'll find. Um, also, a, a key part of the regional growth strategy is stationary planning in addition to centers planning. So that's an expanded area of emphasis. Um, we, you know, talk a lot about anti-displacement and the concern for displacement as growth occurs in Vision 2050. And so you'll see in the checklist a call for, you know, thinking about what kinds of displacement strategies will need to be put in place to prevent this into the future as different places grow. Um, and then also, as Paul mentioned, there's a whole new chapter on climate change. So the checklists all have expanded climate change uh, sections. And then lastly, um, in the transportation section, surprisingly, I think this is maybe one of the least changed out of some of the sections, but there is more of an emphasis on uh, electrification of the transportation system and emerging technologies and innovative financing strategies. So that's just a little taste of what's changed. But like I said, I encourage you to, after this, hopefully go and kind of look at the checklist to see the expanded list. Um, so the other thing that we heard whenever we were going through this project and updating the manual was that we needed to be a little bit clearer about what we look for for certification. Um, we like to think about the certification focus area sort of falling into three buckets. So the Growth Management Act has a lot of very specific transportation related requirements. Those are listed here, things like making sure your land use assumptions and travel demand forecasts are consistent, that you're documenting service and facility needs in your plan, that you're planning on how you can fund and um, those transportation investments, that you have a demand management strategy, and that you're planning for non-motorized or pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Um, we look for consistency with our regional transportation plan. And so that is whenever we uh, get a comprehensive plan, we look at what projects, big projects you're accounting for, and we make sure that those are included in the regional transportation plan and there's some consistency there. And then also that transportation modeling methodologies are consistent and shared based on the shared regional growth assumptions. And lastly, there's the consistency with Vision 2050. Obviously, there are a lot of MVPs, and that's the whole purpose of our checklist. But some of the key things that we look for is consistency with the regional growth strategy, consistency with climate change and air quality policies, um, that you're, if you have transit in your community, that you're making sure that you're having equitable transit-oriented development, and then that you have proper policies for housing supply and choices near transit and job centers, so that you're growing in a way that you can support the, the growth coming to you, um, and that you're consistent with Vision 2050. So there's some expanded emphasis on this in the new manual. Um, I just want to reiterate again the process. So, you know, the gray bar at the top here sort of shows the planning process for a local plan, be it a comprehensive plan, a long range transit plan. You always kind of go through scoping, policy development, and then adoption. So at each of those phases, there's an opportunity for you to use either the plan review manual or a consistency tool. So I'm going to do a quick demo of the consistency tools. I know that everyone is anxiously wait, awaiting to see these. Um, so hopefully, uh, so you can find them on the plan review manual or plan review website. Um, this is where you can go get all the good plan review information. You can find the plan review manual here. And then the consistency tools are all listed here. We have developed some instructions 
if you, you know, are not maybe familiar with Formsite or filling out online forms, this is hopefully a good resource to help you, you know, understand how to use the form. I think it's pretty intuitive. We're also always help, um, willing to help and help you figure it out, but I like instructions. Hopefully you'll find them useful. And then lastly, the form itself. So this is a big improvement from that fillable Word document that we had some years ago, hopefully. Um, it's very similar to the, the uh, PD, uh, the documents in the manual itself, where you have the introduction, a little user guide to help you understand sort of the different icons and sections. And then those resources are still available here. You can also from here get a PDF of the tool. So if you want to print it out and have it for reference before you get to the point of filling it out, that's totally fine. Um, and then you just click through the form. There's a submittal page where you enter in your information. Um, you get to tell us whether this is a draft plan or a final adopted plan upload any of your documents. This could be your plan itself. It could also be staff reports that could help us in our review or SEPA documentation. And then any other web links or information that you wanna to provide to us that can help us kind of understand where you are in the process and what kind of information you have. And then, uh, like I mentioned, there are some discussion questions that kind of get at more of the, the process and things that you can't necessarily just point to a policy and say, this is what I did. Um, so these are optional, but we really encourage everyone to fill this out. It's also really nice because we can see what you've done. And then if another jurisdiction says, oh, how do I do that? We can say, oh, well, so-and-so did this really cool thing. You should check out their work. So it's a really great way to share best practices. And so then you get to the checklist part, and this is where we have the policy objectives on the left, a space for you to put in your page and policy references, and then some optional open and uh, just space for you to share with us any information about, you know, how you meet these these different um, checklist items, or if you, you know, don't really have a policy in mind for one of these, then you can kind of give us a rationale or uh, explain kind of how your plan addresses things. So we hope that this is both good for you to kind of just look back and go through your policies, but it's really helpful on our end whenever we're re reviewing because then we can just more clearly do the crosswalk between your policies and the Vision 2050 document. So now that everyone knows how to fill out the tool, we'll go over the process a little. So as I mentioned earlier, we really want to see draft plans. This helps you to really feel prepared to go through that certification process. It also helps us because we can flag anything that may not be addressed that could be a certification issue. And so to trigger this process, um, you fill out the tool online. And whenever you fill it out, we'll get a notification. And then that kind of lets us know we need to contact you and we'll be in touch about your process. We try to review things within 30 days. And once we do that review, we'll schedule time, chat with you and you know answer any questions. And then we'll prepare a, a comment letter or an email that kind of identifies the things that we really um, see as if there are any certification issues or maybe the things that are just really great and we want to uh, call out as being exemplary and really advancing Vision 2050. And then hopefully after that point, you're still early enough in your process that you can go back to your jurisdiction and work with your planning commission or your council to maybe make some changes to your uh, draft policies before you go through that formal adoption process. Um, so in addition to the reviewing of drafts and helping you fill out those tools, we're available to help in a lot of ways throughout your planning process. Um, we are constantly meeting with jurisdictional staff or agency staff one-on-one -on -one to discuss either plan scoping or plan scheduling. Um, we're also available to present to your councils or planning commissions or boards. Um, one of the things that stuck from the working group through this project was someone said, you should come to our council before we ask for money at, for the budget process for the planning consultant, because then it really amplifies like we need to update our plan. So we can do that. We can come and present to your council and your boards about Vision 2050 or the plan review process. And then lastly, we're available to just answer any of those random Vision 2050 questions you have, either about the consistency tools, the checklists, or you know, just any of the many planning resources that we have on our website. Um, if you have you know, questions about how you can maybe add a new policy to address something in the checklist, we're happy to brainstorm with you, point you to additional resources. So um, we do have this 
kind of generic email plan review at PSRC.org that the whole growth team at PSRC kind of monitors. So there are lots of us available to help and we're here to help you through your process. We don't want you to feel like you're left hanging and um, we want to help you have a successful planning process. So now I'm going to turn it over to Liz and she's going to talk about the plan review process once you've adopted a plan and get to the certification. So Liz, you can take it away. Great. Yes, this is a very exciting part of the process where you find you finish the work, you've adopted the plan, and um, how do things work on our end? So uh, what we do at that point is uh, we review and prepare a certification report based on the consistency tool that um, you've provided um, in our review of the plan. And we develop a draft report and we'll share a draft report back with the jurisdiction um, so that you have a chance to see um, comments. We have a chance to talk about anything that um, may need to be clarified in the report. Um, and then at that point, we submit the report to our boards for certification review. So our board process uh, includes um, all, both of our policy boards, the Growth Management Policy Board and the Transportation Policy Board, making a recommendation um, to our executive board. So our executive board is the final decision-making uh, point, um, but uh, it's a, a, usually about a month-long board process um, to uh, go through that process. Want to go next slide? Um, so I, I, only, I noticed that only one folks, uh, one person is from a transit agency, but others may have interest in this. So we'll just mention the process related to um, transit agencies because it is a little bit different. Um, under state law, we review Sound Transit's plan and um, they'll submit a, a certification, a conformity report, or, or, certification uh, information for the conformity report um, and the executive board takes action for other transit agencies. It's really a coordination role and so it's an opportunity for um, us to have uh, an exchange with a, tra a transit agency about their long-range plans um, and provide any comments that we may have. So it, that's not a, a board process, it's more of a review process and coordination opportunity. So a little bit different based on the transit agency but um, it's an important part of um, obviously addressing filling vision 2050 is having a robust transit system and a great opportunity for us to help coordinate. So there are three potential certification outcomes that are presented to the board for um, as part of the certification process. So there's a full certification, which we, uh, in, which the board indicates is the plan is fully consistent with vision 2050, the regional transportation plan and other requirements under state law. There's also a process for conditional certification. So basically that the plan meets the majority of the requirements that we're looking for, but there's a limited number of things that um, may take some additional time to address um, after the um, plan has been adopted. So usually involves a shared time frame, So um, some amount of time to address the remaining issues that we've negotiated with the city or the county. Um, and under with the conditional certification, a jurisdiction is still eligible to participate in our transportation process. It's just another step in terms of making sure that the, the plan fully meets the requirements under um, vision under the under GMA. So um, it's a, a process that we used as part of the 2015-2016 updates and prior to that as well. But um, obviously, we're really hoping that as part of this process to um, do the work early and to uh, look at the uh, requirements before uh, kind of we get to this point that we can hopefully avoid some of those uh, more some of the conditions we identified last time. Um, there's also an, op an option uh, for the board not to certify a plan. So if a plan is not certified, um, it's sort of considered to be inconsistent with vision or with state law, and uh, uh, the plan would then not, sort of not be, the jurisdiction would not be eligible for um, to participate in our transportation funding process. So PSRC's executive board is final decision-making body for our plan certification process. So um, those are the options. Um, the plan review manual identifies a few frequently asked questions that um, goes into more detail about them, but just thought I'd mention a few of them just in case some, some of you may have those questions and may want to um, ask about um, any of these as part of the Q&A. But uh, we're often asked about how PSRC's certification process relates to the Growth Management Hearings Board. So we do track um, appeals to the Growth Management Hearings Board just to see kind of where um, plans are at in the process. Um, if a plan um, appeal is related to an issue that we may be looking at certification, we may um, hang on to the certification process just to make sure there isn't any confusion between 
um, the jurisdiction, and um, it, it tends to just uh, be a, just an opportunity to um, let the hearings board process play out so they don't have to kind of come through a couple times. So it tends to streamline the process a bit to do that. Um, but they are technically a separate process. Um, question about how does certification impact eligibility for transportation funding? So a certified or a conditionally certified plan is required for jurisdictions wanting to compete in our transportation funding process. So um, that's really kind of the big one of the big hooks and um, there is a, a impact in terms of eligibility related to certification. Um, is there an appeal process for certification decisions? Um, again, we really are trying to do our best to work with jurisdictions and head off any problems before we get to this stage. Um, but our interlocal agreement does describe a process of um, basically impaneling a group of hearings examiners of, to appeal the uh, to hear an appeal. But um, ultimately, it kind of comes back to our executive board. So um, it's a process that really kind of ends up with our executive board. But there is a process um, described in, in, the, in our interlocal. We do get a question, question um, pretty frequently about annual amendments. So a lot of jurisdictions are regularly updating their comprehensive plans. And um, what we do is we track uh, submittals to the Department of Commerce. So we see some of those coming in. Um, I would say for the most part, most annual amendments don't rise the level of needing an updated certification process. Um, there are some where major changes to a transportation element or an updated trans uh, transportation master plan, things that really would directly address um, things that are in certification. Um, we would certainly um, take a look at those. Um, and if you have any questions about you know, whether an annual amendment would sort of rise to that level, you please feel free to get in touch. But um, for the most part, our focus is on the periodic updates because this is where a lot of your efforts are focused and where there are more substantial um, changes that are made to plans. Uh, Andrea and Paul both mentioned um, resources, and certainly PSRC has got a lot of planning resources out there. So um, we have an updated page on our website um, with Vision 2050 resources. Um, so we have a number of existing things, um, including the Housing Innovations Program, some guidance about growth targets, um, displacement risk mapping, as well as other data. Uh, and we do a regular peer networking event where we uh, provide kind of ongoing discussions and best practices from our jurisdictions. Uh, we are working on a number of things um, in preparation for the 2024 updates. So Vision 2050 identifies a number of areas for us to develop additional resources and guidance, and we are busy doing that. Um, so we are updating um, and developing a housing strategy and an equity strategy, um, and both may be really good information to help support the plan updates. Uh, we are working on a, a, a guide for economic development elements, um, as well as more resources about um, transit and transit supportive densities. Um, as part of the taking stock work, we heard there was a lot of interest in multimodal level of service and concurrency and trying to identify some additional resources around that. So, um, that's one of the things that we're working on, um, as well as climate change. There's certainly a lot of other resources from um, the state and other agencies um, on climate change, but uh, we will be doing some additional work on that. So those are just some of the things that we're working on right now, trying to get work um, on resources done um, with enough lead time so that you're able to use them um, next year and beyond uh, to update the 2024 updates. And I think Laura put the link to this page in our uh, in the chat box, and we will continue to update this page as things come available. So um, you can feel free to check back and um, find more. So in terms of what's next, um, I think from us, you can expect in 2022, we'll probably send around a survey so we can better understand kind of where cities and counties are at in terms of their update process. Uh, we know a lot of jurisdictions are just getting started now or just starting to think about it. So wanted to give um, jurisdictions some time to sort of figure out schedule. And so we'll probably ask about that next year. Um, and then in 2023-24, we'll be looking to do some more workshops, hopefully in-person workshops um, in, in collaboration with other agencies um, to help um, identify any issues and questions that folks have as they're beginning work um, to support the updates. Um, we'll also be looking to do some outreach to consultants because we know a lot of jurisdictions um, use consultants to help support the updates and it helps to get all the information shared. So 
Um, as I mentioned, we continue to have regular uh, peer networking events. Uh, we'll be releasing more materials. Um, and certainly, as Andrew indicated, we're happy to come talk to you directly uh, if you have questions or issues that come up along the way. So we have another poll question. I'm going to say if you can, we'll, we'll mention that in a moment, but um, as we're doing that, you can also be thinking about if you have any questions or things that you'd like to or for us to address. Um, so maybe start thinking about those now or adding those into the chat box. But here is our poll question. So we're doing a lot of different resources, but we're curious about what types of things sound particularly interesting, what you could, what we'd find helpful. Um, if you have an other, um, please feel free to add that to the chat box. We're very curious about what that is um, so that we can provide resources that are most useful for you. Oh, I'm glad we've got we've got a lot of uh, a lot of votes across a variety of fronts. So that's great. Hopefully, um, something something for everyone. Okay, we'll give you just one more moment if anyone wants to click in. Great. Well, it looks like. Uh, again, a, a lot of interest in resources here. Um, lots about housing. I'm not surprised. There's definitely a lot of ha lot, lot happening around housing, um, including work on equity and anti-displacement, uh, climate, um, and certainly, um, if you have other ideas or things that um, you might find useful, we're always interested in hearing that and uh, could maybe try to help you out with that too. So. Um, thank you for that. I think I'm going to pass this over to Andrea to, to help um, work on getting our Q&A going. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, so Laura from the growth management team has kindly been a volunteer to Q, uh, facilitate our Q&A session. So hopefully you all have been inserting your questions into either the Q&A box or the chat box. So Laura, do you have any um, that you're ready to ask us? We do. We have a few questions queued up and ready to go. Thank you to attendees for submitting those and feel free to submit more. So the first question, can you um, clarify a little bit more about um, how the transportation element is reviewed versus the rest of the plan and how that affects certification? You know, we didn't decide who's going to answer. Are you going to, you can answer Liz. Then. I was going to note that Lori asked that question and right after she asked, Andrea hit on slide 20 that talked about those focus areas. So hopefully that, that helped answer it. But Liz, you, you were going to say a little bit more than that. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, we're interested as part of the focus areas in transportation related provisions. I think under state law, there's a number of things that are identified for, um, in terms of the scope of what we look at that um, think that look at certain densities that look at air quality and look at things that may be on, go beyond just the the kind of square walls of the um, transportation element so that's why we end up looking at other elements but ultimately we're looking for things that are transportation related as part of our certification process um, so yeah the list that andrea provided um, it's also outlined in the manual it talks about things that kind of most directly um, uh, relate to those uh, transportation related provisions that we most especially look for. So we, we should say that in the certification, uh, the checklist and our review covers the full breadth of Vision 2050. So we'll try to provide feedback as comprehensively as we can. The actual action by the board is on the transportation related provisions. And as Liz said, some of that's directly transportation and sometimes the board extends that to the things that they see as falling within that that framework of being related to transportation in fact one of our past certifications hung on an annexation issue so that where the board saw um, annexation as being worthy of kind of falling within that certification framework so um, it, it's ultimately a board decision as to some of those things that might be in a gray area Great. Next question. This comes from Andrew and he asks, do functional plans such as a transportation master plan or a surface water and or utility plans need PSRC review and certification? 
That's a great question. I can take a crack at it and Liz, you can augment if I miss anything. Um, so we certainly look to those plans whenever we're reviewing your comprehensive plan, especially the transportation master plan, um, going back to that consistency issue. So making sure that what land use assumptions are in your plan are in that transportation plan consistent, but we do not certify those plans separately. So we just certify your comprehensive plan in the end. Uh, but Liz, Paul, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I think just to the extent that you, cities do things differently. So um, the, to the extent that um, the city or the county is addressing requirements for the transportation element in a master plan, um, that's certainly some, where we would go and look at that document to see kind of how, the, how those things have been addressed. So I think it depends a little bit on how the city has uh, approached the work. Um, and yeah, I think ultimately we're mostly looking at the transportation element, but sometimes cities put information elsewhere and that would sometimes, that sometimes brings just part of the fold and um, review. But for, for things like surface water or um, utility plans, those are not things that we um, necessarily spend much time looking at. Andrea, I'll see if I can say this part right, but feel free to correct me. The, the tool that we have put together, it has a place to say, Where's your comp plan? Give us the web link for that. And are there other resource documents that help kind of provide some of that supporting? Like Liz was just saying, sometimes people will take something that's a GMA requirement, but they really put it in a different document and then they make a reference to it. So if you do that, the tool has space to kind of fill in and, and say where those other documents are. Did I say that right? Yep, that's correct. Thanks. Okay, next question is from Jennifer and she asks, will there be any changes to Vision 2050 to ground truth once the 2020 census data is released? Oops, oops, I was about to talk, put myself on mute. Liz, do you wanna take this one on? I, I mean, I think we're very interested in the census uh, results at this point, I, I think my speculation is that they're not going to be significant enough to uh, need to update Vision 2050. Um, you want to shed light on any of the kind of technical work we do kind of behind the scenes, Liz? I, I mean, I think that that captures it pretty well. I, I mean, I think that uh, where you might one could conceivably see things would be in the growth strategy to identify kind of what growth has already happened. But um, there isn't necessarily an update planned to um, update the base year because there's work that's already happening in terms of the targets. So um, I think that the census work will most directly affect local growth targets and your local comprehensive plan. Um, certainly we're always um, reviewing and tracking things um, as part of Vision 2050, but it's not necessarily going to, um, at this point, shape um, an amendment to the, to the plan. All right, I'm looking through the Q&A dialogue as well as the chat and I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. Might give folks another minute to put those burning questions in there, but maybe we've provided so much information that we just answered all of the questions. While we give folks that, I'll put the next slide, which has our contact information. So if you find yourself thinking of a question after this, feel free to email any of us and we're happy to answer any questions that maybe come to you after the webinar. Yeah, and we've emphasized kind of reaching out to us for questions, using us for resources. I wanna say that oftentimes our best information comes from you, from cities, counties, and other agencies. We see really amazing planning work at all sorts of different jurisdictions from small towns to, to work Seattle and other metro cities are doing. Um, we'd love to hear about the work that you're doing. Um, now and then we have chances to highlight it and share it with our board. So um, if there's opportunities for you to give us updates about what you're working on, we know many of you are doing like housing action plans or housing needs analysis out of the, uh, the state funding. Um, we're trying to track a lot of that stuff, um, but we welcome having those discussions with you and um, sharing things with other staff through our peer networking and our regional staff committee, as well as with our boards. 
And we do have two more comment or questions. So looking at the clock, we hopefully have time for both of these. Uh, the first is from Dan. He asks, how does PSRC coordinate with the Department of Commerce in your review? That's a great question. I can take this one. So um, as I mentioned, we, we work really closely with the Department of Commerce. So whenever we do a review, we'll often um, either copy them whenever we send a comment letter or we may coordinate if we know that we're both doing a review at the same time. We may get together, I think, before we kind of formalize our comments to make sure that we're consistent. Um, and then I think as we get closer to the update cycle, we'll be coordinating with them on some of those things that Liz mentioned, like doing a joint workshop to make sure that we're partnering and giving out as much information as we can um, together. Uh, same with the Department of Transportation because they often are reviewing uh, the transportation elements. So I think as we get closer to reviewing draft plans and the adopted plans and we'll coordinate with them and make sure that we're sharing our comments letters and um, just, you know, trying to be as consistent as possible to make you as a city or county staff person's life a little easier so you're not getting, you know, conflicting comments or uh, questions. Paul or Liz, do you have anything you want to add about how we work with them? I, I'll just say real quick, I know we're short on time, we want one more question, but um, we know that Commerce is also just starting its process, they've hired or in the process of hiring a new staff person. And um, so they'll be updating some of their plan review resources here um, in the coming months, and we'll continue to coordinate them as Andrea was saying. And I'll also mention we monitor the plan view website. So we try to keep an eye on things coming through in that way too. And that helps us to reach out to you and see things that come through the system. So that's another way that we coordinate. All right, this next question comes from Jason. And he asks, will the review comments provided by PSRC specifically identify issues that must be addressed to receive certification? Uh, will there be identification of critical items? I'll take that one. And the answer is yes, with maybe a caveat. So we will uh, be working on how to make our comments and our th that we respond back as effective as possible and clear as possible really trying to identify those things that are good to do versus like you really must do these things and try to provide as clarity as much clarity up front as possible. The caveat is ultimately our board makes that decision. So I mentioned annexation being a certification issue for one plan last time. Staff actually did not recommend that. The board <laughs> kind of went over the top of us and said, no, we, we want to include that in that specific instance. So Similar to your planning commissions and city councils, ultimately they make the decision. Um, staff is writing the comment letter. Um, we can't, you know, we don't supersede the authority of the board. So ultimately we try to make the, we will be working to try to make the letters as uh, clear as possible about what's really certification uh, oriented. Uh, but ultimately that decision about certification is a board decision. I think that's our end, Andrea. Um, I'll let you maybe close it out, but I, before you do, I wanna give a thank you to everybody that joined us and uh, listened through to this. And to those of you that are uh, maybe watching this in the future as we'll record it and post it online, but really appreciate um, you tuning in and the coordination that we need to do between regional and local and state uh, to make all of this happen. Yeah, um, thank you everyone for attending. I am thrilled that we had 100 people on this call. Like Paul mentioned, it will be recorded and put on our website. So if you want to watch us again or share it with your colleagues, you can do that. We'll also share the slides. And uh, please reach out to us. We want to work with you and help you. Uh, we've worked with many of you already. So we look forward to working together as you all update your local plans. Thanks for attending and have a good afternoon.